The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small, portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts, plus they're IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials, order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Oh. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Batteries Included podcast. It's March the 28th. 2024 and this is episode number 30 thank you very much for joining us on today's show we'll be talking about electric pickup truck to- electric pickup truck towing torture testing <laughs> genesis announcing magma performance sub brand with its gv60 fisker continuing to circle the drain and of course much much more i'm dominic yoni joining us today is the Convivial, Mr. Tom Logney, Senior Editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the most memorable Mr. Martin Lee <laughs> from the EV News Daily Podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us, or will join us in a moment, uh, from the majestic, practical palatial halls of Outerspec Studios, where he produces high-voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels, along with Dave Connor, who captains the Outerspec Dave YouTube channel. Hey there, everybody. Hello, hello. What's up, guys? All right. Good to see you all. Um, so I guess let's kick this off with the EV News Daily Weekly Reporting Roundup. Okay, well, let's kick off with some news this week. And we saw some photographs online of the first Tesla V4 superchargers, uh, third-party ones uh, that we think going in the ground. These were actually in the UK, so called Utoxita, and they are the EV Point branded ones. Now, I keep calling them V4 superchargers, but they're nothing to do with Tesla. They make the hardware, uh, but I need to get my head around just calling them chargers because uh anyone can use these they're not just for teslas uh, uh but otherwise yeah they are tesla v4s aren't they uh tesla's cybertruck is being prepped for wireless charging the first couple of teardowns are happening online right now and uh, some sleuths on the internet found a couple of the orange high voltage connectors vacant and then somebody did the unthinkable and actually read the manual and it says yep they're ready to go for uh, an inductive charging uh, so we'll wait and see if tesla have some sort of pad for the bottom of your garage floor up their sleeves tesla launching complimentary full self driving for anyone who's an existing owner for a month and tesla mandating uh, driver demos on all new handovers now if anyone's ever bought a new tesla you know it's very hands-off in fact uh, one of my listeners in sweden said that he did the whole thing because all the paperwork was done on the app never saw a human being i'm used to that with taking a car back for service and then pitch- picking up a, a loner and doing it all on the app and never seeing a human but this is a complete 360 on that a very hands-on experience that elon musk mandating this week where staff members will take you out he wasn't clear in your car or one of their cars, uh, but for a drive to show you how full self-driving works. That's the complete opposite of the Tesla experience. Reminds me of 10 years ago when the Model S launched here in the UK in 2014. In fact, June 2014, uh, the Model S launched in right-hand drive, of course, pre-facelift. So we're just off 10 years of that. And you'd go along to a showroom and there'd be lots of people clapping and a silk cloth and they'd whip it off and you'd see a brand new Tesla. It's a different world these days there. You're lucky if they wash it. Tesla is starting advertising on the likes of Facebook and Instagram. No love lost between him and Mark Zuckerberg, but behaving more like a traditional car company and some above the line spending to boost those end of quarter numbers. Here in Europe, Stellantis will build Leap Motor Cars. That's a Chinese company, but they've got exclusive rights to build and sell those in Western markets. And Maybe those cars will even arrive partially built with cheaper Chinese labor, finished in Europe, avoids any of the incoming tariffs, and uh, we'll interestingly see if that model is copied by other big car makers. Chevy is refunding any Blazer buyers who were the early ones before the stop sale 
and the software fix. They since reduced the price to, again, juice the sales a bit and get attention. Uh, but Chevy doing the right thing by those early owners mm -hmm. and giving them the price difference back. Xiaomi, the famous name in technology, TVs, mobile phones. I think my toothbrush brush is a Xiaomi toothbrush. Uh, they're now making EVs, doing what Apple couldn't. And actually, the uh, the Su7, as uh, one of my Chinese listeners uh, informed me, every, everyone is calling it the Su7, but uh, it's the Su7. I'm reliably informed. We'll see if, <laughs> if my source was wrong. That is a car about the size of a Model S, but for the price of a Model 3. In fact, $4,000 equivalent cheaper than a Model 3 in China. Get the one that's the same as the entry-level Model 3, and you get better specs on almost every metric. And the Chinese love their homegrown cars. It's probably going to cause a few sleepless nights for Western car makers. Fisker and Nissan's deal fell through this week. Uh, Fisker also said that they would not be able to meet some of their obligations because of those financial issues they reduced the price of the ocean by twenty four thousand dollars would you take a risk on buying that vehicle uh, some say they're just clearing out inventory before the inevitable if they pull through though and pull this off it will be the greatest escape since steve mcqueen actually he was captured in the end that was a bad example north vault broke ground in germany aesc expanded their south carolina operations where they'll make cylindrical cells for the neue Klasse vehicles made in mexico B BYD made their 7 millionth EV this week. That does include plug-in hybrids as well. And finally, Ford unveiled the Explorer. For my US viewers and listeners, it's a different Explorer than what you think. Uh, this is, though, based on Volkswagen's MEB platform. So many of the specs are the same, like the little battery bump that the ID3 GTX got recently uh, with the 79 kilowatt hour battery. It gets that, but otherwise, it's very much a Ford car, but based on VW stuff. There are some, if you really look for it, there are some similarities, but Ford very much saying we've redesigned it. This is our own thing. Uh, but that's, of course, for the European market. It could end up, I don't know, elsewhere, but for now, uh, that vehicle, I think styling looks great and has a very decent engineering underneath it. And that is all for this week. Oh, by the way, you can catch EV News Daily on your audio platforms every single day. If you watch this and you are not yet subscribed to the podcast, what are you waiting for? It's free, and you can search YouTube for EV News Daily as well and catch the video version. Ta, ta, ta. Yes. <laughs> All right. I just want to say, Martin, I've been really enjoying the EV News Daily uh, feed this week. The show oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're the one, are you? Okay, I'm sorry. I had, I had a viewer. It must have been you. So if, if you love to hear what's happening in the industry uh, in the and the dulcet tones of Mr. Lee here, then go to EV News Daily YouTube channel and tap that bell icon for notifications. Get, so you get a reminder every day. You get this, you know, Mr. Martin Lee popping up on your <laughs> screen. All right. So let's get into it, I guess. Um, let's see. Kyle should be joining us any moment now. <laughs> he just, he just messaged. He's on his way. He's on his way. Right, so I'm going <laughs> to do this intro like he's here, but because uh, I have faith, right? Okay, so let's get into it. Kyle, <laughs> for the past few weeks, uh, maybe, I'm not sure, hopefully you can hear me. I'm sure you can, right? Just talk really slowly. <laughs> okay. For the past few weeks, you've been all about electric pickup trucks. I mean, we, we knew you were all about them before. You've owned the Rivian R1T for some time now, but a couple of weeks ago, you picked up your Tesla Cybertruck and immediately raced it against three other pickup trucks from Jacksonville to San Diego, electric ones. Uh, but you haven't stopped. You, you got these Tesla Cybertruck home. Let Colton put together a video about uh, how to clean it for the out of spec detailing channel. Then you did a range test along with the uh, Rivian R1T Ford F-150 Lightning and Chevrolet Silverado EV, which we talked about last week. Now this week, you've created a new extreme towing challenge route called the Rustic Ring and ran, ran the Cybertruck through it while towing a Rivian on a trailer. Apparently that wasn't enough though. So you got th the four main electric pickup trucks available on the market today, uh, not including the Hummer EV, and hooked them up to four identical trailers, stuck a Tesla Model 3 on each trailer, <laughs> and raced them 500 miles over the Rocky Mountains and back. 
Uh, geez, Louise, Kyle. Uh, so I want to I want to go in some details about all of this, uh, but first I should also mention that the uh, part one of the Ocean to Ocean EV truck race that I was referring to at the beginning of this uh, little spiel uh, went live last Friday. It's like a really long, two hours and some. So if you haven't seen that, I don't know if and if you're interested in you know. Um, racing EVs across country and, and charging strategies and uh, everything that can go right or wrong. I think people uh, are because it's had well well over 100,000 views, maybe a couple of hundred thousand views. That first yes. part has done massively well. So people are very, and I also saw it um, widely reported as well, sort of it's it spread out to other parts of the media. So I think it captured attention, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had it on Inside EVs as the main uh, like banner uh article and uh it it stayed in the number one spot on the site for like three days i think so okay. uh yeah it was uh there's a lot of lot of interest in kyle's uh range tests with these wow there and there he <laughs> is <laughs> and so part two will come out we think tomorrow right kyle of the ocean ocean ev race yep it'll come out tomorrow and then part three will be the following uh saturday right cool um, so I don't know if you did you catch all that uh, intro. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell us tell us about the rustic ring. <laughs> yes, basically. Oh, have you guys already talked about it? We don't need to talk about it twice. <laughs> no, no, we just didn't. No, we have the about intro. It. It's just an intro. <laughs> intro. Setting you oh, okay. up. To, setting you up to talk about it. Great, basically, well, go ahead. So basically, you, you set up a like a, a a big route somewhere in Colorado, and for tortured tests torture testing trucks i think while towing and then you've you've put your cyber truck through it so we want to just talk about that a little bit so first what what is the idea behind this this big how long is it and uh, like what what do you try, think you can find out about the trucks when you run them through it yeah so it's 86.7 mile loop uh runs <clears throat> through the town of rustic colorado which is why we call it the rustic ring because we start and end at the office. It uh, has thousands of feet of elevation change. So it's constantly hardcore uphill, hardcore mm. downhill, hardcore corners, uh, dirt as well, which is really cool. We've only published the Cybertruck video so far, but I've been running a lot of these this week. I've done Silverado EV, Hummer EV, Model X, and more Ooh. to come. Ooh, so X. we've learned a lot about uh, this uh, ring and the towing tests and what we're uh, you know basically able to learn from the vehicles if anything it's a it's a great way to get the vehicles in a pretty extreme state to give a full review of towing because we start and end in the city by the office we go straight up a mountain pass for you know 12 or 13 miles of just straight increasing hardcore elevation and then that turns into straight downhill for a few miles so that rapidly heats up the driveline systems rapidly heats up inverters and uh, we're really able to push the the thermal capacities to the maximum and the battery cells typically battery temperature isn't going to be an issue but the cell chemistry and the cell characterization of allowing that much regen after that much acceleration actually it was a limiting factor we found for the cyber truck and um so yeah ultimately it's a it's a pretty hardcore test we have two categories of trailers we've decided on a five thousand pound category and a ten thousand pound category maybe we'll do more as capabilities in, in you know increase in the future um but for example hummer ev the tri-motor version can only tow 7500 pounds so we had to run that in the 5000 pound category because that's the maximum it can do so you can't compare that vehicle to Cybertruck and Lightning and other things that we're running on the 10000 pound test so ultimately yeah it's it's a hardcore test we have a highway portion city portion and mountain passes make up the bulk of it, it gives us a good review of how a vehicle tows what uh, what what were your surprises, both good and bad? What met your expectations? Any uh, any things that stood out to you? Well, what we didn't really realize when we ran the loop for the first time. I have to give a huge shout out to my friend Will for creating this loop. He's the one who like was like you know real hardcore from here and was like, "This is the road you know loop you need to do." And we adjusted it a little bit based off of what he said. I found a little bit harder mountain climb on the way up, and then we mosey on over, but the the dirt road section is 
a pretty grueling test. I mean, that's a test of suspension when mm -hmm. it's under load with a trailer and it's all washboarded out up the hills. So the mm -hmm. tires need to stay on the ground and you need the traction to get up. And I was driving the Silverado EV, which you'll see in an upcoming one. And I was wide open throttle the whole way up the dirt hills. And it was like, I don't know if this thing's going to make it up. Um, and then certain vehicles like Hummer EV, as an example, just walked its way up there without even noticing a thing, just like crawled which, up there. Which, so which one walked up? The Hummer EV. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, it's just got those big fat tires that just oh. can soak up the bumps and crazy suspension. And again, we had half the weight on the Hummer that we did the Silverado because of right. tow ratings. So right. it's been a really cool loop. We're not going to hammer all the videos out at once. We've just been filming with the vehicles we have now. We'll you know, space them out so we don't overload everyone with EV towing content, which we've done <laughs> this week. Um, but that's fine. I mean, everyone wants to learn how these things operate. At least I do. So that's what, yeah. what we've been testing. And from an en engineering perspective, I guess the regen part is, if anyone thinks it's all about getting up to the top of a hill and, and uh, actually coming down the other side is really interesting as well because thermal management, how much regen you get, how much you have to use the brake or not, I guess that becomes a, an interesting part of teaching people about EVs, the engineering of it as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, the Cybertruck had major regen limitations right after the start of the first hill, and they continued throughout the test. And whether that's a thermal issue or a cell issue, it's definitely showing that, okay, we're reaching some limits. My Rivian ran into regen limits without a trailer on this loop. So it's no joke. Mm. On mm. camera, sometimes I look at it, and I'm like, this looks so easy. But then in person, you're like, I can only see the sky right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. It's nice Correct. to have those un undercarriage uh, cameras on the Hummer in that situation. I guess, but I guess with the Hummer, did, you didn't really need it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not like we're off road. We're still on right. public roads here, so it's right. uh, it's manageable. It's just with a our trailer is pretty big, so it's actually like when you have the Silverado plus the trailer was pretty hard to maneuver up the hill, actually. So uh, you know, you got to take the widest line possible just so you don't fall off a cliff. And are these all public roads? You, are you meeting people coming the opposite direction and, and or are you using some private roads for your testing? No, it, this is all public roads. This is County Road. It's actually County Road 69. So we call it the 69 Hill Climb. And awesome. uh, it's, a, it's a fun, it's just an enjoyable thing to, to go and, and run. And uh, yeah, everything here is right in our backyard. It's all publicly accessible. And, you know, that's what we want to do more of. We're really lucky to do all of our testing in Colorado. We moved here to do vehicle testing. And this is part of the reason why we have some of the best roads for pushing electric vehicles uh, to and beyond their limits sometimes. So how, how is the, uh, the thermal capabilities of the Cybertruck on this route? Yeah, I don't think thermals were an issue. I don't think okay. we've run into thermals on any EV yet. Okay. But I think we've run into oddities about cell recharging issues and uh, blended brake issues. And we've the, the Cybertruck so far as out of all the ones I've tested, which to be fair, si the Silverado EV is way beefier than Cybertruck, but um, that's sort of performed the worst out of them. The Model X did great with the 5,000 pound trailer, but again, that's the maximum rating of mm. the Model X, but only 5,000 pounds, no big deal. So we're learning that the 5,000 pound category is pretty easy, but we still want to review vehicles that don't just tow 10,000 pounds. So we're going right. to keep that two category system and it gives us a more of a review and less of a hardcore stress test, but it's still interesting. Um, we're logging all the efficiencies throughout the route. We're logging the state of charge check-ins throughout the route. We DC charge all the vehicles to hundred percent before we leave. And so that way the batteries are warm and we're logging percentage point check-ins. And actually the Cybertruck, we did not DC charge at the start of the uh, trip. That was the first one we ran. And uh, when, you know, next time we run it, I'm sure we'll do it again just to update the numbers with whatever procedures we end up changing along the way. Uh, we'll run, we have this one, so we'll just run it again. Mm. Sweet, nice. Um, so, on, in the, so this is a 10,000 pound tra challenge with the Rivian R1T on the back on the trailer. So what do you put on the trailer for the 5,000 pound limit? Yeah, so this is, it's like just under 10. It's like 98, 9,900 with the Rivian. Um, but then we figured like there's always some stuff in the Rivian anyway. It's probably close to 10 <laughs> by the time we get there. And the smart car is oh. the perfect weight to get to 5,000 pounds with the trailer and the smart car. Oh, that explains that picture you show. Oh, I should, I need to find that. You, you have, so you have the, uh, 
a convertible towing. I saw I, I saw a pic of one of the doggos in the smart car, and I just thought it, I thought the sun had come out, so you got the smart car out of the garage. <laughs> uh, no, well, I thought it was really funny because the Hummer EV is a is a black and white electric convertible, and then we had our black and white electric convertible <laughs> towed behind it, which it's very rare to have electric convertibles. Awesome. Yeah, and you had two, and really, what, I saw the best <laughs> comment, Kyle. Somebody commented, "Tonka truck towing a Hot Wheels." <laughs> that was like the best comment on Twitter. It was yeah. perfect for that. Yeah, it's basically what it was. But that's honestly all the tri-motor Hummer EV. It was just a little bit less than it could do. Um, you know, it can only do 7,500. I heard the dual motor Hummer EV will actually do 12,500 like the Silverado 3WT EV. So really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's odd. Kyle, just curious. Could you give us a quick, one sentence like what surprised you about each car like cybertruck thermal sucked lightning um the brakes couldn't handle it like it w is there like one thing you could say quickly about the, the those trucks yeah we haven't run the lightning yet only because ford gave us one without max tow package so i have oh, to borrow wow. a friend's truck with max tow our lightning is only rated I'll get for mine <laughs> yeah well, exactly our lightning is only rated for 7500 pounds um, but max yeah. tow puts you up to 10,000, which makes no sense to me because it doesn't seem to adjust any suspension components. It's just the additional compressor, I thought. But fly, we... D fly Dave to Jersey and make him drive it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but each truck. So Cybertruck uh, definitely has some software to finish up and really needs more regen capabilities. The uh, Model X towed really well. I mean, very, very well. But again, only 5,000 pound and no integrated brake controller and no four pin connection, which was a little bit annoying. The Hummer EV is just can't tow enough and blends too much trailer brakes when you're regenning. So I ended up turning the trailer brakes off um, to try and recapture more energy to make it more efficient. It's also extremely inefficient, but that's just Hummer EV anyway. And the Silverado EV definitely has the most range and everything could actually use a bit more power when towing 10,000 pounds. It's okay, but you do have to go wide open on some of the uphills um, in terms of power. And yeah, has the same problem with Hummer EV on the brake blending situation. We're just learning a lot about the vehicles. I mean, there's a ton that we're learning and they're all in these videos and they'll probably end up being roughly 30 minutes long each, which I think is reasonable for a towing review of a vehicle. You can't right. make a 30 minute video. I mean, there's no, <laughs> yeah. it, it'll Kyle. be however long it is for me to explain it. Kyle, let's put that out right, right now. It's not going to be 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think they will be, but if they're not, right. then uh, too bad. Don't watch we'll it. See. I don't know. <laughs> no, people love your long videos. I just don't yeah. know if you're capable of making a 30 minute video. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. I didn't so, think I could make an hour and a half video, but it ended up our, our race to Florida ended up being an hour and a half. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, your hard. content's great and people watch it. So why make, why work hard to make it shorter? You know, it's well, just, there's just no incentive. A, we put all the information in the long video. So like, if you want to learn about it, you got to watch it. If you don't want to yeah. learn about it, why are you watching the video anyway? And, uh, it's there's entertaining. Like, and and like, what would we cut out? I mean, our we did this uh, towing video over the Rockies this week. That was two and a half hours or something. Jordan initially called me, said the video is five hours. I was like, okay, that's a bit crazy. <laughs> um, but two and a half hours for towing, you know, it took us a full day to do it. That's a pretty, you know, that's a snapshot of what that's actually a, happened. A I know. So what did happen? Like, so uh, I guess towing over like 500 miles over the Rockies and back again, it sounds like uh, you should really lay bare most of the issues with towing an EV and charging actually, because this was like a charging race you did in this other, other video. So uh, you mean the one where we went over the Rockies with the yeah, truck? Yeah. Yeah. 500 mile. Yeah. So it? we had Rivian R1T cyber truck, uh, Silverado EV with a big battery for and, WT. Yeah. And lightning with the big bat all, all trucks had the big battery of course okay. uh, except for the rivian that did not have the max pack that was large pack right uh quad motor as well but that came in second place so that was pretty you know the the max pack dual motor thing wouldn't have changed the running order at all um yeah silverado just smoked it but my biggest takeaway was i drove an electric truck with a trailer but it wasn't mm -hmm. light it was 6500 pounds um and you know of course had a car on the back a heavy electric model three and i drove it from denver to Grand Junction, which is like most normal people that don't know about electric cars, like you can drive to Grand Junction in an electric car. That's crazy. And so I did it towing 
and I didn't even stop to charge, and I arrived halfway with 14% remaining. I then charged for just under one hour and drove all the way back to Denver without stopping in the Silverado. This is unheard of. It's crazy. And that's just what happens when you slap a massive battery in your truck. So, right. you know, it had 215 kilowatt hours usable and I was just cruising. Around. It was literally no impact to my trip whatsoever. It was truly amazing. Big annoyance, though, is not having a front charge port. We learned that on this trip. Right. We knew it, but we really learned it on this trip. How annoying a rear charge port is when towing. It should be just not allowed. You should have, if you have a tow hitch on your electric vehicle, there should be a secondary charge port up front. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a problem. I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about uh, uh, charge receptacle locations like this week. And really, you know, I, I really think that the Nissan Leaf and the Hyundai Kona, Nier, Nero, Nero, Kia Nero EV have it right with it on the front, you know, and the Rivian R1T, I guess it's just, it's on the front as well. So those, like those cars, but you know, in the middle, so you can charge them, you can pull up into a, like a Tesla supercharger and you don't have to worry about if the cord's long enough, it's going to reach, it's right, it's right there. Right. And even with the Rivian charge port kind of being in the non-native place for the supercharger network, a lot of the new stations, they're installing them right in the center of the spaces. So like uh -huh. our new station here, I can pull up with my Rivian and I'm not blocking two spaces. The cable just reaches. Right. Perfect. That's the way it should be, I think. And then also and there will with, be with extension the... cables out there very soon. You know, for well, Tesla that and sounds companies. sketchy, Tom. I think yeah. either from Tesla, Tesla or whatever. I yeah. know it's, I know. I, it's that's, that's I find it's it hard weird. to believe Tesla would put something out that didn't integrate well with their ecosystem and was safe. Totally. But I, I, but I, we'll, I don't know. Their Cybertruck doesn't integrate very well with their ecosystem. <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what about cable cooling and thermals with extensions? That just yeah. seems fraught with yeah. just, well, I don't know, it doesn't work. I hope but, there's a little chip in there that yeah. interrupts the signal somehow and will derate based on temperature or have a boost profile set yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. You put a, a car, you put a social video up uh, recently with, and you took um, the Rivian to a, is it a new, a new Bucky's stop um, mm -hmm. or a new superchargers there? And that seemed to be in a location that just suited the Rivian really well. You didn't even stretch the cable. You just right. pulled up, you're you like straight in. I thought, well, that's a, I tried to get my head around the geography of that, of that supercharger. It's it Tesla. It's confusing to Tesla owners though. I watched a couple back in last night, and they're like, "I have to stretch the cable this yeah. much to get to my car." It works. I mean, it definitely works, but it is a bit. It's like a little bit just awkward for everyone the placement, but it kind of <laughs> works for everyone. Okay. Hmm. Um, I was going to ask something. So anyway, the towing race is out. If anyone wants to see it, we also yeah. have a summary on the Out of Spec podcast. If you don't want to see it, and um, you know, it's all it's all there. All right. So, you did no pull through charger. So who 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 won the race? What was the or Silverado EV? Yeah, I was home sleeping before the guys finished in the rest of the trucks. Okay, so they had they they, they had to stop more than once, I guess. To uh, four times. Oh, really? And the all Cyber the other ones five times. But Tymon messed up on the Cybertruck. To be fair, Tymon really let the Cybertruck down. He chose all the wrong chargers, but also there's a lot of wrong chargers you can choose. I mean, Tymon's a pretty serious EV road tripper. He's done cannonballs with us. Yeah. He should know what he's doing, but he just right. did not think to check or remember that Tesla made 120 right. kilowatt stations. Oh. Um, he's so used to only hitting V3s everywhere. So right. he went to the first station he went to was 120 kilowatts, and it was just... Uh, just, just let the Cybertruck down right there. But I, I don't. It's not like the Cybertruck would have been anywhere near what the Silverado could do. So we, you know, still posted the video, obviously, but um, and gave time in a bunch of crap for not optimizing. So I guess what another takeaway is that there's actually enough. There's enough infrastructure to do this. If they had to charge four times, they they could find chargers to go charge at to actually complete the route. Oh, between here and Grand Junction, there's probably twenty DC fast chargers. Right. There's That's they're everywhere in the mountains. Sweet. That's good. So, um, yeah, I guess so. But for the for towing, like hardcore towing, I guess Silverado is the way to go right now. Then, oh, no question. That's the beast. I mean, you can't buy one. That's the sad part. It's a fleet only. There's a right. few for sale on Auto Trader and Cars.com, and I think they still require a fleet account if you purchase those. Okay. Um, but they'll be popping up used here pretty soon. Some, you know, Hertz bought a bunch of them. Others bought a bunch. They'll get cycled in and out of fleets, and they'll end up in private customer hands here. And that's going to be freaking awesome. They launched right. the 3WT this week as well. 
um, but only took five grand off the price. No, and so that the three WT had already been out. Oh, they that's launched, already out. Yeah, they launched the three WT one fleet, which oh. is like the real base one. So it's like okay. steel wheels, nothing nice on the inside. I mean, that's what these trucks are. These are the work trucks, but this is like the fleet work truck. So it's really stripped out. And that's seventy five grand. No, it's sixty five grand. Sixty five, still expensive, but that's yeah, better. One hundred eighty kilowatt hours usable. Yeah, that's not that's. That's an interesting deal, interesting value. Not that much more to go for WT and just get the nice stuff and more range. Yeah, but if you're a fleet customer, eh. every set, like every every dollar counts. Yeah, and you're buying you fifty, the hundred range. of them. Honestly, yeah. they should come out with like a a seventy five kilowatt hour version for like forty five <laughs> grand, and that would be fine for most fleets. That's what the Ram charge is doing. Yeah, well, right. I don't have the the Can't wait. gas engine. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, let's see. Is that, uh, I guess we're probably through with trucks for a little bit. Um, anything else you want to say about that, uh, Kyle? Uh, well, we took them out of the racetrack yesterday, which is important testing. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that yet or not. Okay. Yeah. So we, we did a driving dynamics um, video. It'll go up probably Sunday, is my guess. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe Monday. I don't know. But either way, it's a full, like, here's how they all drive. We've done everything with them. We're going to go off-roading this weekend with them. And okay. then uh, then I think we're done. Then I think we've covered their basis. Right. So, so uh, how were they How were they on the, on the track? Like, Totally, like wildly different, each one of them. Right, right. I can imagine, yeah. Like, insanely different. You know, the Rivian is, like, fun and drifty and uh, almost felt like a sports car out there in comparison to the other vehicles and – um, but then like overheats after one lap, it uh. just like, uh, yeah, just can't handle it. So it's mm -hmm. like, give me this great chassis, this great powertrain, and then no thermal ability whatsoever. I mean, zero, you get a couple skids in and then it goes red, uh, turtle mode, nothing. Sorry. Interesting. I wonder if the, uh, dual motor does any better with th thermal management. Yeah, they say it should. It's oil cooled. Um, so the quad motor system is not oil cooling. It's okay. just a water glycol jacket cooling. On the outside hey, of the stator. Do you know if uh, Rivian's going to make their own motors for the four for the quad? I mean, they make their own motors now for the for the dual motor. Do, yeah, when the, when I went to the dual motor launch, I'm like, why don't you just take four of these and make it your quad motor system now? And they're like, yeah, that'd be a good idea. Wink, like, yeah, that's what they're going to do. Okay, yeah. awesome. So that'll awesome. probably launch with refresh, is my guess. Okay. Mm. Wow. It's kind of struck, just struck me like refresh the Rivian. What do you do with that? Because can you change the, like the, the, the faster, like the face design? At no, all? You, you don't change the design. You make it a technical update. You make it charge way better. You make it have way better thermal ability. You give it mm -hmm. more power. Now that Cybertruck is faster. Um, you know, it's got to, got to do so many things better. It's got to have more efficiency with the heat pump, which we know it'll have and better driver assistance, which it's not very good driver assistance. Um, right now it requires pre-mapped roads, which is just annoying. So there's a lot they can improve, but it's already a pretty up there product. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed my time in it for sure. Um, all right. So Tom, speaking of racing, uh, I see you put your video up of driving the Polestar four on a frozen lake up in the Arctic circle. Um, deliveries of that car start happening sometime in the next three months. So I just wanted to ask, uh, like it's, it's a pretty premium car and it's priced like that. What do you think? will delight owners about it the most it's hard to say you know it's 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 like a performance suv you know and i just don't know how many people are in the market for that you know it's it's i mean it it it, it way like you know out kicks like the it's it's air like the market that it's going to be appealing to in my in, in my opinion this mid-size suvs that people use as family uh, haulers it like performs way too good for that segment in my opinion at least uh, you know at least on ice i mean it was nuts uh how well the uh the, the torque vectoring system works it was designed by borg warner they call it i think tv dc the torque vectoring dual clutch uh, technology this was really a uh like an engineering visit to show what they can do in extreme cold weathers on on frozen surfaces and you know polestar two things is a performance brand and they're also you know from the roots are with volvo and nordic country where 
you know, everybody drives with studded snow tires, you know, half of the year. So the, the vehicle has to be able to work well in those uh, environments. And that's really what the purpose of this was to show us how well it performs and how well the, um, uh, the traction assist systems work. And it was amazing to me. I, I don't have a lot of experience driving on frozen lakes. I did once just fool around once, but not really to try to test a vehicle out. Kyle really should have been on this one. And I know he wanted to, um, that's if you're watching on the camera, now you're seeing the track they had set up on the lake and you know, it, until, you know, we turned off the systems, I almost couldn't make it slide. You know, it was that good. And uh, most owners don't want the vehicle to, you know, kick out and have fun with it. They just want to know if they're coming into a turn that's a little icy, the vehicle is just going to do all the work for them. They got their kiddos in the back and they want to be able to just navigate around whatever comes on the road. And the, the vehicle performed really well. You see right there, Yoakum, I think it was ride home i know kyle, kyle knows him also he's their um head of chassis development for uh polestar he was in the vehicle with me and um you know it, it i i would love this vehicle personally uh but i'm i'm trying to figure out is this going to do well here it starts at seventy four thousand with the performance pack it's eighty four thousand uh it's it's a hell of a vehicle uh but Price-wise, it's going to be a tough sell here in the U.S. I don't know how many people are, are looking for, you know, a 5C SUV with that kind of performance. I, I, you know, I think people would rather get a vehicle that fits in that class for fifteen, twenty thousand less that maybe, you know, doesn't have 671 pound-feet of torque. Uh, so I'm, it's, it's hard for me to really understand where this fits in. I think it's a wonderful vehicle, but it's almost as if they over-engineered it. They put too much effort into making it an, an incredibly performing SUV. And I think sales are going to be hurt because the price is just, and that's, they just slashed the prices like $10,000. The, 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 uh, the performance pack version was going to be like starting at 90,000. And, uh, you know, this is even at 84, it's going to be a tough sell and that's starting. So, um, I don't know how well it's going to do. I think it's a, a wonderfully engineered, uh, crossover, you know, compact SUV, but um, I'm concerned that it's 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 not going to sell a lot because it's just too expensive. You, you, we always talk about picking up EVs three years down the road or two years down the road used. This would be an amazing you know forty thousand dollar pickup. You know once it's you know used market two years old with eight thousand miles. That that, that would, it's an amazing vehicle for that. But I don't know. It's seventy five to eighty five thousand starting. I don't know how else going to do here. What, what do you think about that, uh, Kyle or Dave? Actually, hey, Dave, good to see you back there. Hey, hey guys, hi. How are you? All right. Hey, so, so what? You, what's your take? I mean, you've been in a lot of you trade a lot of cars back and forth. You you've been in a lot of. What do you, what do you think about the addressable yeah. market for this thing? I actually saw the Polestar three in the showroom in New York City a while back, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a, you know, wonderfully um designed car uh, i'm happy to hear I, I actually didn't realize the kind of performance uh you know that you're talking about um coming out of this vehicle it's it sounds like i agree with you that it's probably overpriced for what the majority of the consumers are looking for um but you never know i mean it depends on you got to keep in mind this is a global launch i would imagine so they're going to be sending these out to many different markets and not just the US, but, you know, 90 grand or 85 grand for this where it wouldn't qualify for the tax credit and with the performance pack, you know, might be a tough sell. But then again, for those people spending that kind of coin, maybe they wouldn't qualify anyway. I, and, and this truck wouldn't because it's made, you know, outside the United States as I think about it. So, but no, it's what, made in South Carolina. Oh, that's right. It is made in it's South Carolina. It's going to be, yeah, yeah, Volvo's Ridgefield. Let, oh, that's right. So plant, the yeah. base one would qualify, but the performance pack wouldn't. That'll really create a. They have to adjust that. They're going to have to adjust that. Yeah, but look, they I sat in the vehicle. Ten thousand. Yeah, they're going to need to drop it more. Yeah, okay. I sat in the vehicle. I'm um, six five. I fit. I fit really well. I thought it was great, but it wasn't anything crazy different that that I would say. Wow, I got to have that. You know and. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit of an odd brand, especially here in the States. Mm -hmm. So I wish them the best of luck. It's good to hear it drove well, Tom. Tom. The big question is this or Porsche Macan EV? Yeah. Ooh. 
That's, I mean, I guess it comes down to almost as like design, design and styling, and, and I guess an interior feel as well. And also, driving know. dynamics will be totally different. Right, right. Um, hmm. And you that's the thing, also? U.S. buyers. If we're talking U.S., you know, you ask somebody, you know, do you want a Porsche Macan sitting in your driveway, or, or do you want a, a you know, a Polestar three? Right. You know, not a, we understand vehicles way more than the average consumer. But, you know, a lot of people, when you get up into that price range, a lot of it is prestige and image, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I know we don't care about that, but a lot of people do. And, right. you know, to, to you know, if if this could have launched at, you know, you know, with the dual motor long range at fifty five thousand, the performance pack at sixty five, sixty eight thousand. You know, I'd say, wow, this this is a, an incredible vehicle, and I think they're going to sell well. But where it's positioned, I I'm I'm concerned that that they're not going to have a lot of takers, and it's unfortunate because I think it's a really really nice vehicle. Hmm. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. I agree with that. I think this is more desirable than the Macan EV personally. I think right. it's cooler, it's quirkier, it's got the I own a Polestar, so I think it fits in with my garage nicely. But like, um, there's just something when I sat in this car, I was lucky enough to have the first video tour of this car, I think. And when I posted that, I thought no one was going to watch it. There would be zero interest and the video would tank. And the opposite happened. It rocketed, did like a hundred thousand views in a couple of days, which back then for us was pretty big. Mm. So there is interest in this car. It does have some serious cred. I don't necessarily love the idea of doing torque vectoring with the clutch system in the back, but uh, it can be okay. Just the response time is sometimes a little bit slow uh, for my liking. But again, it's not. It's there just to check a feature off the list and and work reasonably well. I think what you described, Tom, a lot of the safety systems Volvo does a great job of. But most cars also have pretty good ESP and and control systems in extreme environments. So I, I was really curious in watching your video when you turned ESP off and watching the guys drift it and the B-roll and stuff really gives you a chance to show, okay, they really did engineer this thing to be fun and enjoyable, as did Porsche with the Macan. So, um, yeah, I mean, th this is going to be the fun. It's like work's not going to be boring for the next year as we try and figure out these problems. Yeah, wow. it's it's never completely off, as you probably know. You know. Right. But uh, it it t it removes enough of it so you can have some fun for sure. Well, I did a couple laps with Yoakum driving, and as well you know, he's not just you know head of chassis development. He's also you know like probably their best test driver. And yeah. uh, you know we we you know we took that whole course sideways. You know with him just not letting up on the whole thing, which was you know uh, legions above my skill level on ice but uh it was it was the the vehicle just was able to do whatever he wanted it to do so i i give them credit they engineered they to me it's almost over engineered for like 99 percent of the people that would ever buy one but um and i hope that doesn't cost cars. them what's that that's most yeah cars, no i know i know but even even i think even more so i think all the the uh, perhaps all the money they put into making this such a fantastic performing vehicle has pushed the price up to a, the stratosphere where I don't know how people are going to respond to that. You know, when you look at the, 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 the SUVs that are in that class, you know, that size five seat SUVs, you look at the prices of those and you say, well, you know, you know, what, why is this $20,000 better or, or, or $15,000 yeah. better? You know, your, your point about them getting cheap in two or three years will happen. These will tank and that's going to be the buy. Yeah, absolutely. I would yeah. love to pick up one of these for 45,000, even 50,000. No, they'll be in the thirties in no time. Yeah. You think? Well, look at e-trons. They're twenties. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like, I, I don't, yeah. I yeah. Guess. They're just going to, I, I feel like the Pulsar, it's probably just a, you know, a spec above the e-tron e in like engineering and, and design and yeah, just but much it's going to happen. Every car depreciates. So True. this, True. this is going to, and I think no one, the general public still doesn't know what Polestar is. So right. I know that because I drive my around, mine around. They're like, what is that? I'm like, it's a Polestar. And they're like, what are you saying to me? And so I just tell everyone it's a Volvo now. <laughs> yeah. So I know. It, some, it makes it easy. Well, it's you almost could have to do that before, but really now you can't. <laughs> now that Polestar's, I mean, Volvo's really, um, you know, uh, making that separation. Yeah, but I get that all the time, too. Online. People I'm ask me sure. all the time. Yeah. 
I saw like a funky looking electric Volvo and I'm like, did it have a different logo? And they're like, yeah, it was like a star. And I explained, so they don't really know, you know, that there's, no. this is like a, a, its own brand. Right. Oh, should be interesting. looks like Pol sounds like Polestar has some uh, marketing work ahead of them. If you know, if they want to be, I think they need to make themselves like an it brand, you know, like the, the thing to buy. So they need to, you know, some sort of, marketing outreach with celebrity or whatever, you know, it takes them to get that to happen. I don't know. I think well, one of the things, Dom, sorry to interrupt. And I do that no, a lot. I know. Please. I'm sorry. One of the no, things that Polestar um, talked about in this press meet was that um, they have multiple polls taken. This surprised me a little multiple polls, you know, they do old market research. And when they asked people in America, list the top performance brands and they, they gave the names of the companies, you know, you didn't have to pull it out of your, your hat. On, on all the different polls, Polestar was number three. Porsche was number one. I forget who was number two, but Polestar was number three. So people do identify it as a performance There's brand. No which way. I, there is no uh, way that data is accurate. People yeah, are going to well, go. They, they, they had Porsche, three different surveys. Lamborghini. Where they, thousands Ferrari. of people. They might not well, have included, Kyle, they might not have included the uh, super high end, like, you know, crazy luxury brands like Ferrari and Lamborghini. It might have been like, you know, $100,000 and less. These are the brands selling cars. List the performance brands. Oh, that's at least I the information Polestar gave us. People they pulled. There's no way. Maybe they pulled like current. <laughs> I was surprised owners. to hear that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. Crazy. I don't know. All right. Uh, so. Tom, this week you also released your Electron Vortex NAX to CCS1 adapter review. Now, we should say that these are third-party adapters. They aren't approved by automakers for use with their vehicles. But, uh, but knowing it's going to take some time for people to get their official adapters and will buy a third-party third one anyway. Uh, so you're reviewing a couple of the main units that appear to have some amount of decent engineering, I guess. Uh, so you've already reviewed the adapter uh, from A to Z last week, and this week you showed us the Electron. So just have it hold up to your testing. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, the limited testing. I've used it a bunch so far already. Okay. I, every opportunity that I can now, I'm using both the Electron and the A to Z to charge uh, my Lightning and my Rivian. I'm lucky enough I have two vehicles that I that are authorized to use the Tesla network. Uh, so far, I haven't had any problems with any of them. Uh, you know, and that's all we can do. And, and you have to go back to what you said, Dom, the fact that we know people are going to buy these. And that's really why I'm trying to shed a little light on, 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 on these. The, peop the Ford customers, Rivian customers, and now all the other OEMs that are going to eventually be authorized. I've had people send me emails, Ford customers and Rivian customers, that not Rivian customers yet, Ford customers saying they applied for their adapter. And it said, like, your estimated delivery time is October. So... You know, people are anxious to 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 get these and use them, and it's going to take longer than 2024. There will be people that do not that apply for their adapter in 2024 that don't even get it till 2025. We know people aren't going to wait; they're going to go out and buy adapters. So I'm doing this to try to highlight some of the ones that I think maybe are better made than the other ones. Um, and it's still very early on. I mean, the only real test I could do was measure was was keep using it. I dropped them. See if they break. I, I and I and uh, all my charge recordings now. I'm constantly taking a temperature of the unit every five minutes. That's surface temperature. So um, it's still cool out now. So uh, the adapters are getting the benefit of say 60 degrees out. So th the air is cooling them a little bit. I can't wait till it gets a little bit hotter. I'd almost you know, as soon as it gets like hot in Arizona or something, I might fly out there and 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 see if I could use it like when it's 115 degrees. But the you have to keep in mind both. Of these companies have told me and companies lie that they have designed it to conform with ul2252 which is going to be the standard that adapters get ev charging adapters get tested at right now there is no standard even the tesla adapter is not sort of safety certified um so we we, we we don't know that could be the worst engineered adapter on the market we don't know that i would that would shock me if that turned out to be true well, we'll find out um, because you're gonna you're gonna test that one too right yeah, so there's a little weird thing about this. I told everybody that I was going to review the A to Z. I was going to review the Electron and then the, the official Tesla adapter. I did my two reviews on A to Z and Electron. I'm holding back re reviewing the Tesla adapter because as Kyle and I said on previous shows, the adapter that Ford gave us from Tesla 
is not the final version. It's It was like an early version prototype. And Ford told us, we're giving you this adapter, but you have to give it back to us when we ship you the, the real one. So I don't think it's fair for me to do a full review of this Ford adapter or the Tesla adapter I have now, because evidently there's something on it that they're going to improve upon. So I'm waiting to get that. Uh, as soon as I get that, I'm going to review that one. And then I'm going to do one review with all three of them and talk and make like charts on temperature and uh, ro you know robust construction, size, weight. I bought like a new digital scale so I could weigh each one and just so give people a complete view of everything about it. You know, the, the electron adapter is the biggest and the heaviest of all of them. So you would mm -hmm. think that that means maybe it's the best made. Not necessarily. The, I dropped it a few times. The one time I dropped it, it already chipped. The A to Z mm -hmm. seems like it has a more robust shell. Um, it seems like you could drop the thing a million times. And the only thing that might break is the latch thing is I don't like the A to Z's manual, um, NAX lock on the bottom. You have to manually lock, lock, lock the, the NAX connector to the adapter. I don't like that. The other two adapters do it automatically, but the official Tesla adapter, I really don't like how you unlock the latch. I don't know if Kyle has any issue with it, but it's, 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 um, in, in, in the adapter, you got to stick your finger in it. And it's the hardest or the most cumbersome adapter when you're holding the adapter and the connector to get it and unlock, unlock, unlatch it. I mean, that's just a usability thing. That's not a safety issue. But if you if if you were to tell me all three adapters were were equally engineered, I, I prob the 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 Tesla adapter might be the last one that I use for ergonomics. Um, okay. But but just ergonomics. So we'll we'll continue to follow up on this. There's going to be other adapters coming to market. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, um, you know, if I'm going to review any of the other ones from these other companies, I picked A to Z and Electron cause I've used their adapters for years, other types of adapters, and they've been relatively, um, well made. So that's where I'm we're sure. at. That. And yeah, I'm, Brandon, I'm sure this is nothing to, uh, nothing, nothing to worry about these third party ones cropping up online. I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry. That's sarcasm by the way, in case anyone wants to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, no, 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 there's going to be some really low quality ones. There's going to be CCS horrible ones too. out there. Like, yeah. what's this? That's CCS two. What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. I mean, this is this is a a friend of ours who roofing tracker Jose. I guess some people, some companies are sending him, or want to send him some third party adapters who. And yeah, this looks like they don't know what they're even doing because they're they're suggesting CCS two in a CCS one market. But that is no use to me at all. Right. Uh, all right, uh, Tom, are you are you doing all right over there? We're having some video connection issues today. We lost Martin a few times back there uh, some some time ago, and now Thomas, you've been frozen in that position. I don't know if you want to disconnect. Oh, really? Or reconnect, but... I'm still frozen. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. How, how cold is it there in New Jersey? <laughs> it's not cold at all. I'll. Uh, I think it's my laptop. I think I'm gonna get a new uh, laptop. All right, let me jump out and jump back on. Cool. Okay. All right. I, I, I want to talk to him about uh, oh, he's, he's, okay, there he is. No, I want to talk to him about charging. So uh, Tom and I, this week, earlier this week, we talked to the founder of uh, and CEO of Gravity. Uh, I'm not sure if they go by Gravity Mobility or, or officially or not, but they need Gravity. I'm back? Yeah. Yes, you're good. Right on. Um, so we, we, Tom and I talked to uh, Moshe Cohen, the founder of uh, Gravity this week. And so Gravity made a whole pile of headlines a few weeks back when they opened up a charging center in Manhattan with 500 kilowatt capable charging, uh, they say. Um, so this week it, it announced 200 kilowatt curbside charging for urban centers. So we had, a, and you can check our, uh, the batteries included uh, YouTube channel for that episode talking with him. That went pretty well, I think actually. But Tom, you went there and visited them. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about what you thought after seeing it in person? I know, or should we wait for your video? No, no, I'll talk about it. You know, um, I haven't even started editing that, but I'm going to do it probably today and tomorrow. Actually okay. today, you know what I have? One of my followers has a Hummer EV and if you guys know um, the issues I had in the past trying to get a good charge recording, um, he supposedly has all up-to-date software and has said that it's been charging fine. And he's driving here from Pennsylvania. And right after the show, um, he, we're, the two of us are going to go to a, a DC fast charger and see if I can get a good, clean recording. 
Um, okay, so put that to the side. Yeah, that but guy's that, awesome, by the way. And yeah. Um, yeah, I've been doing a bunch of this 24 module charging this week. Sorry to the electrical grid of Colorado. Uh, but yeah, they charge much better. But Tom, that you have a five degree Celsius arrival window. If you are out of that arrival window, you will not have a good charging experience. Yeah, and I know, and I know if you put on the preconditioning too early, right? It's too it, no, it gets the too trick warm. No, is navigate to it using the built-in software, and you'll be yeah. okay. But do okay. not manually precondition. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I'll 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 I'll, I'll do that because I haven't really used one since I did the previous recording. So you know more about this and than me. You and need to use a charging station that's I think the the btc ones not the signet ones the btc ones will output the full power you can't use the gm ultium sites the high power delta right. sites you only get 175 kilowatts on those no, how gm branded stations don't work with gm cars <laughs> but you have to go do an ea btc because then you'll get almost the maximum but hummer ev will will peak at almost 380 kilowatts wow and there's no public charger that can do that so yeah. you'll be you'll be charger limited for most of your charging. Yeah, no. Well, I have I have those one um, EA site, the, the North Brunswick site that um, I've been able to get really good like Tycon recordings. And it, it never seems like it's limited. Well, that's that's the 800 volt system. But I, I've watched I've never seemed to be limited from this one charger. Um, and I also was thinking about going to an EV go, but not to, um, the the. Um, let me see. I actually reached out to, uh, to you can to use an to EVgo talk about signet this. station. No, please, not the signets. They, don't they, use a Delta. Yeah, they, they 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 literally told me don't 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 use the the signets right now because of uh um. So you can't I'm use not, the signets, and you I'm can't not use get the a good, deltas. <laughs> yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah. No, but not yes. deltas, not signets. Um, I, I I just got the uh, the um. Anyway, they gave me a site that they said I should not have an issue with, and I forget which one it was. But um, but if you can go there, that's the best because they give you the voltage reading of the. Yeah, path. that's what I wanted to get, and that's why I reached out to EVgo to talk to him about it. But um, you know, there's the the most of the ones in my area are signets, and I can't find this. Is it a double um, and make sure and, HVAC is off. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah, no, everything will be off. But um, yeah. Uh, so we'll see. I'm gonna tr I'm gonna probably try to try the EVgo, and if it, if I'm not getting a good response, I'll go down to that one EA station that I always seem to have good um uh, charge recordings with. But um, the guy and, who's going to bring it to you, I can't remember his name. Is it Michael? He's super Jeff. Jeff. Okay, he's super awesome, and he um is actually I think bringing his Hummer out to Colorado to have Colton detail it at some point cool. in the near future. He's going to be pulling up any minute. I could like bring him on the show. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, Colton said, Hey, if we don't see him, he's yeah. awesome. He's yeah. the guy, he's the guy who I reached out to when I needed a Hummer for videos here. And he found uh, our new friend, Patrick on the forums and Patrick came up and brought his truck up yesterday. So oh, nice. this guy's connected, knows all yeah. the GM stuff. Yeah. So, and he, and he said the truck's ready to rock. It's got software updates. It's, it's, it's good for good recordings. He's been testing it. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully I'll get a good clean recording. I can finally publish that video. Um, and I have like some behind the scenes information about what was going on. You guys remember, I was trying to get information from GM. I kept emailing them. They were giving me, um, you know, it seemed like the runaround at the time, but now I've recently learned why they were giving me the run runaround because it created a big, you know, thing back there. Cause all the data I was sending them was correct. And, but they didn't, I guess they didn't want to publicly say, yeah, you're right. You know, it's effed up, you know, <laughs> but um, I was able to talk to somebody recently that was willing to tell me what was going on behind the scenes. So I'll talk about that when I put out the video. Um, so this started off with Dominic talking about the gravity station, which I visited, visited yesterday, 24 stations, uh, 300 and I mean, 500 kilowatt max. And I couldn't believe it. That's, the site's packed already. Oh, really? I couldn't believe it. There was like almost complete utilization, but it's it's not like people know about it. The The big reason was the city has this um like taxi service system now with, with Toyota BZ4X of uh. all vehicles. And so they're pulling in all day long. So they're not pulling a lot of power. Right. And uh, Moshe actually... Like we, and we talked about this was just was was like disappointed. He was like he was like I built this <laughs> this freaking site here that you know has twenty four stations that could be like charging like twenty four Tycons at once, 
And it's just filled up with these BZ4 that, that are wasting an hour to get like 50 kilowatts in their battery packs. But um, that was it was funny that he he had that opinion, which is just as what I was thinking. It looks so, like Kyle so Tom, went, how does it work? It, it, they have uh, I listened in and out on the podcast yesterday in between shoots, but it has a a enough grid connection from an existing building where they didn't have to do any site upgrades, which is unique, but yeah. glad they found that. And right. then the DC chargers are whose hardware is it? They say they make it right. Yeah. It's, I it's, said, it's their own hardware. Like they, they, they buying engineer? power modules and then assembling it and calling it their own, which a lot of companies do, or they have yeah, so, to be. Yeah. So yeah. the, 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 the power modules in, in the, the, um, the, the power boxes. I didn't do a deep dive into that. They were locked, but I'm going to go back and do that. It was, he had like 50 people lined up for interviews and everything yesterday. Cause every, everyone was there. What's the I, interest? Because yeah, it I, just looks like a bunch of plugs in a parking lot. I'm not why, I don't know why it's gotten so much attention. What was special about this? Well, it's, it's really the only, um, for, the only solution that would work like in an underground garage like that, Kyle, it, it has a much smaller footprint and his software allows him to do so, put out such huge amount of power without doing um, uh, service upgrades to, to the area. I mean, I asked him, I said, if 24 Tycons pull in here and all plug in and they all want maximum power. Or, or, or is 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 this whole building gonna like yeah shut but every down? charging hardware yeah. has site level load limiting i mean that's pretty basic i have it at yeah. the office going in now so like what i just don't understand yeah but you also bring in more like well your you your your yeah, thing existing. had power you yeah. have existing i have so many people reaching out to me building owners in new york city for the last two years asking me you got to give me a solution i it con ed wants uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be able for us to in, to upgrade my site so that we can install four DC fast chargers in our garage for for the people that live here. We have you know five hundred tenants or whatever, and it it seems like whatever he has going on on the back end is circumventing that issue. And I don't really uh, personally I don't understand how it is working. It seems like you know magic to me but he, is it he battery he, buffered at all no it's not no. battery buffered no. so, and, and, I mean, and there, there's a there's a line on electricity and you yeah i know go above it so he it's, must it's, be doing load leveling site management does he uh, does he say that he can run every single port so when you say 500 yeah. kilowatts is he just saying 500 amps at a thousand volts or what is what is that limitation yeah, it's basically, you know, 500 amps at a, at, well, at a then, thousand so it's volts. The same yeah. as every other charger. Yeah. It just doesn't yeah. have that top end curve. Right. So but, what but, we've looked at is someone who's just like put in. I'm not. I'm not against yeah. new chargers. No, I, don't, I, don't. I I'm not against it. I just really can't figure out why this is making front pages everywhere because it looks like someone just put a bunch of power modules and some cables, which is fairly simple. It might not be a lot more than that, but it, what it is is a solution that underground garages in New York City can can use and there's currently no other hardware that can fit them it's it's it it's ceiling mounted uh, uh or wall mounted or ceiling mounted with cable uh, uh retraction on a ceiling uh and it works in the city and for the first time these garages now Kyle uh, he, he's offering a solution and so many people in urban areas that are so tight for space, you can't have a DC fast charger mounted on the ground. In, in these underground garages, your bumper has to touch the wall. And then there's barely enough room for somebody to back out. This solution, what he's claiming, will fit in any um, underground garage. And 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 even the, the, the power modules can be, you know, put totally remotely. And uh, what he does is it's not just the building that he's tapping power from he's tapping power from like that the area like he said oh, we we might be tapping power from the, like three buildings on both sides of uh, of us and and we're uh, uniquely managing the power so that everybody has as much power as they need and nothing gets derated so how about the cable management that seems unique okay yeah. we, i've seen a bunch of overhead cable management systems but this looks like it's a, it's like a circle friendly yeah. one Okay, a lot of the overhead ones for fleet use are intended and they're pretty basic and yeah, they work, but this seems okay, maybe a bit more elegant. But the little bricks that they're showing everywhere, 
on the side of the road. Those are not the power modules. That's not a 500 kilowatt power module. No, those I didn't even like, see what brick you're talking about. Oh, it's what like you, a uh, picture of a gravity thing on the street side or something. I don't know. No, no, no th th those are the new curve. That's totally different than what I went to look at yesterday. Okay. Those, those are the new pole mounted 200 kilowatt um, uh, units that but are going to be mounted up on poles. Fire, right? What's that? Oh, maybe that could be. Is that a dispenser with liquid cooling or is that actually doing the rectification charging power? That's what no, I, I, don't know. I think it's just a dispenser That's just because a dispenser. They, they have the cabinets um, are going to be remote uh, located ah, okay. remotely. So they yes. stuff the cabinets somewhere else and yeah. then they just dispense the power. So, yeah, I mean, I got to go visit my dad. You got to go visit. I mean, it just seems like a lot of press because he put 500 kilowatts on there, which right. a lot of these distributed systems are 680 yeah. kilowatts now and more. And so I, I'm just really, I'm not against it. I love new charging. I would go and film this happily and I'd be thrilled about it. What I don't right. like is the headlines of, and I, I guess I haven't researched it, which is why I'm just a bit skeptical as to what's so next level about this. The well, power management side, great. Maybe there's some secret sauce in there. That's cool. But a lot of companies have their own secret sauce on how to get power. The distribution software management, that's also pretty cool. I just, I'm just failing to understand what's so cool about this. I well, the, com the company's not responsible for what headlines come out there. You know, like he, he you know, yeah, sure. Right. You, you know, so um, I, I think it was a big, I think it's such a big, it's, it's getting so much attention now. Well, number one, because Google Ventures invested in it. So a lot of people uh -huh. are looking, oh, Google's chargers. That's number one. And I asked them about that. They just, you know, have investment in it. And, but I think the fact that it's a solution for these, these uh, inner city tight space garages, Kyle, that currently there was none. You know, I, I just, um, for years, it, it's been so difficult to go into New York City because, you, you know, you just can't charge. And and people that live in New York City, and like I said, I have so many building managers ask me that. And uh, Brandon's saying there's plenty of systems that do load. Of course there are, yeah. And there's more and more every day new companies are coming out with, with load management. I was just at the Q Merits annual summit. And there was like a dozen companies that are offering load management stuff. So um, yeah, it might, you know what? It might not be anything that is so amazing, but it might just be another player that's going to take a serious look at um, getting uh, systems that will custom work in really tight spaces. And um, you know, that, that to me, that in itself, uh, if it works is, is worth is newsworthy. Yeah, totally. Right. I'm not against more charging. Like I'm saying, this is great. It just, uh, I just guess I got the impression and a lot of emails like you, Kyle, you got to go figure out what they're doing here. It's so <laughs> crazy. And I'm just like, yeah, they, they packaged it really well. They found right. a really great parking garage. They're providing a needed service of charging. And if it's a new charge point operator with their own design on cable management, that's awesome. And it sounds like that's kind of what it is, which is awesome. Right. He said in the interview, the only thing they're having to buy in, which they haven't got the skills to develop themselves, is the cables. He said, because yeah. they're, that, that's the only thing that right. you, know, you can't just go and create yourself without a lot of money and time and uh, buildings full of engineers. They're yeah. having, to, having to go to the market, and he's not, not satisfied with everything that's out there um, at the moment. But I think what was interesting was he's, I think he's used to doing either the venture capital pitch thing because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't make the interview. I was due to make the interview with him um, and Dom and Tom that is on on our channel uh but um but my five-year-old threw up on me so then i i, I had to uh <laughs> had to tend to other things <laughs> but um uh but you know t tom was asking like oh cool so how are these interconnected and what's the load balancing and and, how, and and he was like and the responses to that was imagine a world in which yeah. the cars could be back <laughs> you know their batteries on wheels and 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 you can have bi-directional power where the cars help the grid and tom's like yeah yeah i know that so how do and i think he didn't know what the inter like it yeah. didn't know that it was us doing it and so he's used to probably kind of i don't know the new york times calling up or the funding from google being like why should we invest in you and, he, and it was it was the elevator pitch there so yeah let's get there in person kyle tom let's get there like you kyle like you did with the ea center in san francisco yeah yeah, yeah. right where was that yeah. um which was like you said to the guy hey can you open the secret doors and show me around the back and he's like yeah yeah cool come and look at the power modules and like that's the videos that that we want to watch and the you know thousands of people that watch this podcast that's that's what we want to see i yeah. got a lot of that when i did the interview so i'm going to edit a lot of that out you know yeah. and, and uh you know Br brandon in the comments here said the guy's a bud buzzword man and moshi's a bit of a a salesman he's an interesting sure. guy and you know he's he's trying to uh make it 
you know, he's trying to, I, I would imagine, get more investment at this point, you know, and he's got big uh, goals. And he, he does see his system being much more than um, charging EVs uh, down the right. road. Um, well, you know, I'll call him. We're going to film the video. I'm Next time I'm in New York, I wanted to do it when I was in New York earlier this week, but we yeah. didn't have time. He, but I'm going to film it. We're going to do it. And we're going to cut through all that BS because I have zero interest. And I don't want to even talk to him. I want to talk to his engineers. So hopefully we can do that. I hate talking to CEOs of companies. There's nothing more I hate than talking to CEOs <laughs> of companies, actually. It drives me insane. I like to talk to the people who actually make the stuff. So unless that's the CEO, we'll talk to the engineers there. Right. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, if you if you uh, go take Brandon with you because he you know <laughs> he's got lots of questions too in, in the comments and he's you know and it's true. Five hundred kilowatts is a big big uh, claim too, and it's, it's hard to test against that right now because there's nothing you can uh, charge really at five hundred kilowatts. So and originally I believe they were going to it's supposed to be three hundred sixty kilowatts. Like if you go on Google Earth and you go to that site, you know it'll there's a banner about a, a upcoming charger you know, charging center being put there and the, the head, the number is 360 kilowatts on that, like before it opened and yeah. somehow that was upgraded to 500 kilowatts. So there's, there's room for skepticism and yeah, we should definitely take a, a deeper look just to see like the, the power scavenging from the buildings. Exactly. How does that work? You know, uh, we also need to stop talking about adding miles in minutes. Can car makers yes. stop it? Can charge? Can can other uh, you know a, a charging company stop talking about it? It's it's I, it's I a pointless it metric. Up, but... It's an entirely right. pointless metric, depending on what vehicle you're plugging in, the efficiency of the vehicle, and a bunch of other things. And I've seen it a couple of times this week. And also, what was the Chinese EV launch yesterday? Xiaomi, the Xiaomi I mentioned in the in, in the intro, they wouldn't give the kilowatt DC peak charge uh -huh. rate they didn't show a charge curve on the screen or anything like that they were talking about miles and minutes and i'm like oh can we just not start this please let's we, if, if you want to do 10 to 80 as a time that's fine we'll all live with 10 to 80 and minutes but otherwise can we just talk kilowatts but please? martin in new york city you might actually get 200 miles of range in five minutes <laughs> because you're just inching exactly <laughs> it might it might be true it might be that on level two specific miles <laughs> yeah exactly but one thing i will say to put a bow on this i think part of um our concerns or kyle's concerns um is that the splash that this made when when you know when it hit it, it hit the market it's kind of like it reminds me when when a, a movie's coming out and you hear about it for a year and then you see it and you're like eh, it was okay a, a, as opposed to you know a movie you never heard of and you show up and you're like wow this was fantastic i think it's expectations i think that you know it, this is being billed as like something different and something amazing and and it really isn't you know but uh it th that doesn't mean it, it's not uh, a good addition to the ev charging landscape um no no you know and i've said this before for me it's just it's 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 a huge step forward that parking garages in new york city now and it, it, you know if, if it all works as it's supposed to work and it seemed like it was working when i was there they have a solution now where okay we want to install chargers in this garage you know we can't really add additional power oh call this company you know that the, the, they'll they'll light they'll light up your garage they'll fit everything they'll package it all in and you won't even have to do a service upgrade if if that's the case it, it has moved the needle because it, we just haven't been able to do that we haven't had equipment that fits that's custom designed for, for for this and you know we haven't really had anybody kyle talking about putting dc fast chargers on poles in 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 cities you know where um you know it's 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 needed level two is great and it has a use but right. th there's an enormous dwell time for level two that not all people have and you know in in these really busy areas where cars are parked for an hour or two right. it'd be fantastic to have you know a whole street lined up with with 200 kilowatt dc fast chargers um if if it's doable uh then you know more power to them so there's still a lot to learn about them and uh, i admit i didn't learn a whole lot you know i kept uh, getting steered in the wrong directions and you know I'm, like i said i'm going to edit things we didn't really talk about the nitty-gritty i told them i want to follow up and come down and do a deep dive into your technology i didn't do that maybe you'll do that beat me to it i won't have to do it but um uh which is fine by me um but um 
you know, I, I just wanted to get down there. I only had a little time between meetings. I was at a the Rivian R2 thing yesterday. I finally got to see the R2 and the auto show. So I had a little time to shoot, scoot over there, talk to him for a few minutes. And he had a whole bunch of other people lined up. He had people from D.C. come up, too, from the government to talk to him about it. So, he, he, you know. Well, that's um, not a surprise. So, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 you know, um, so there's, you know, there's, there, there's a lot, it's, there's a lot of interest in this and I'm sure it won't take long before we flush out, you know, yeah, um, well, it's a great, it's a great exercise in branding. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, right. and let's see, you know, uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, you can't, you can't, you can't show that graphic that you just put up there, Martin, go back to that. <laughs> what was that? It was yeah, a pop-up, wasn't it? Oh yeah. It was a pop-up. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a pop-up from, the State of Charge newsletter. What? What? Which is a, a a Hearst Enterprise company, which I've been oh. rolled in sort of a legal <laughs> battle with for the last two years. Someone so, else is um, using State of Charge. Yeah, yeah, and oh, uh, we've think we finally genius. settled on on having a mutual use. Um, like th they're they're allowed to use it for certain purposes, and I'm allowed to use State of Charge for certain purposes. But um, to make a long story short, the Hearst um media which is this huge company that Publishing, owns like yeah. a whole bunch of like car and driver road and track i don't know exactly which brands but they own a lot they started this thing called the state of charge newsletter about eight months after i started the state of charge youtube channel oh but i didn't trademark the name when i started oh. it. they ah. did so oh. then it became a well we trademarked it yeah but i was using it for eight months before you were right so you know we we, we you know $25,000 in legal fees later, um, we've decided to let each other coexist. They can do newsletter and email notification. I can do video and, you know, car reviews or whatever. So, but that, that's, that's, we, we, we don't, sh we don't show state of charge newsletter on batteries no. included podcast. Right, not that won't happen. Sponsor. <laughs> that won't happen. That won't happen. So, so let's move on and talk about something else. Uh, so it wasn't a huge week this week for for news as far as like new vehicles go. The New York Auto Show was this week, and it's surprisingly quiet on like the electric front. Um, but Genesis, however, chose this time to announce a new performance sub-brand called Magma and uh, showing off a GV60 that gets their spicy treatment. Um, from what I understand, it's lower and wider than the regular GV60, has a lot of the hardware that's in the Hyundai Ionic 5N, and, but it's not meant to be as hardcore as other performance sub-brands like uh, AMG or Hyundai Zen, for that matter. Uh, it's also very orange. Uh, I don't know, Martin, do you have a picture of that? Yeah, that let, me get that there? On, let me get that up on screen, yeah, because it's pretty yeah interesting thing for Genesis to do, which I must admit, you know, Hyundai have N and, uh, you know, Kia have their GT cars, and then Genesis were like, well, we want to have a go as well. And right. you're like, is that really what Genesis is all about? I don't know a huge enough of, uh, enough about Genesis. It seems like that they don't need to go down the hole. We've made it wider, lower, we've added mm -hmm. aero and a diffuser, but they have, and, and this is a production ready. This isn't a concept. This is is, this is going to reflect production. Right. They do, they do call it a concept, but it's basically ready to go. It looks yeah. from, Same I mean, as the, other software things that needed to button down first or something. Yeah. And the, and the, uh, the, the, the Neo Lum concept, they called it, but it's production ready. So, right. Like, wow. <laughs> it's crazy. Look at that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So, who do you think this will attract? Dave, are you in the market for a, a spicy GV60? Your, your wife had a GV60. Uh, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we did have a GV60 and we had, we had the, the spicy one and, and it was, more than what you need. Um, right. I, I, I look at Genesis as more of a luxury brand than, than a, than a sporty brand. Right. Um, that's not to say that they don't produce vehicles that, that move. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good looking car, but it just seems like, Do you think um, that's good looking. No, I'm just saying it seems like a bit of a rolling oxymoron. <laughs> like I don't, I don't see like right. the classy GV 60 and white with the, with the Napa leather seats we had, that was a nice looking car. It, was, it made sense to me. This just seems odd. I don't know. Right. The car itself, I'm saying, I think is a good looking right. car. Right, I like those wheels. <laughs> oh, Matt, we disagree on that, but that's well, okay. that's fine. Well, that's but fine. I'm just but, saying, but, I, don't, I don't dislike the GV60 look, but what did they do to it? Well, this looks like it ended up on its third owner and was passed down to the you know <laughs> teenage son of the third the owner. The modification. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see it a seven series. Big, bigger <laughs> wheel. I mean, bigger, bigger yeah, uh, I don't uh, know. It's, it's, wing it's on the a back. bit confusing to me. I, I imagine after the auto show, they'll have it at Genesis House. 
in the meatpacking district. I think that's My where it is. Is that where it is now? I think it is. Uh, they, they unveiled it at that at their oh, they did house rather than yeah, yeah. rather than the actual auto show. Yeah, beautiful so facility. Yeah, that's know. good. Yeah, if they have their own facility, go and do an automaker day. Yeah. Um, so Genesis also showed off a large SUV concept. Uh, Martin mentioned it briefly there a second ago, called the Neolun, which is uh, which it's thought to presage, presage the new uh, new three row SUV, sort of like the Genesis version of the Kia EV9, but with very Genesis styling. Uh, we don't need to talk about it a whole lot, but I, I was hoping uh, Martin, you might throw up a picture of it because I thought it looked quite striking and relatively close to production. And they're also saying that what may have carriage doors in, in production, which is interesting. I mean, we always see carriage doors in, in concept cars on in, at auto shows and stuff, but very few in the actual production. That so would I be just cool. Thought, I mean, they, the i3 did it, and so that, and and no, let's not pretend it's the first time it's being done. But they said they've got they've worked on the the stiffness and rigidity, and it and they can do it. So, right. BMW uh, BMW also told me we will never make another <laughs> car with carriage doors after like, they made the i3. It's like Falcon wing doors. <laughs> and they were, we're never very, doing it again. <laughs> very adamant about that. <laughs> right. Uh, Simon Matthews asked, do you mean suicide doors, Dominic? Yes, I mean suicide doors, but carriage doors just sound so much better. Uh, do you have another, is there another pick of this down the page yeah, a little I'll, bit? I'll oh. try and find the one with the Can we just talk about how lame of an auto show it must be where there's no big unveils? There's nothing. It's like Kia prologue, K4. Right? No, we've and, already driven Prologue. Prologue. Yeah. And, yeah. No, but what do you mean Prologue? We've already driven it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But for I mean, the it's, public. It's, it's like, it's no, like it's recycled. Auto show. Oh, it has? Yeah. And Gravity? Gravity's been at LA Auto Show. And That's why I, Polestar I didn't know the other day. Four, I think, was making its uh, U.S. debut here. But, I mean, it's how we've already seen it, right? No, it was at Polestar Day. Right. Yeah, we've already seen it. But it's making its, uh, I don't know, they're saying uh, it, maybe it's a three. It was in the U.S.? No, three, four were both at Polestar Day in L.A. like six months ago or something. Okay, right. So yeah, so even then, I don't even know how they how they yes, oh, there's the yes, interior sir. of the Neo Line. I don't think we'll be seeing that exactly. It does look pretty comfy though. Actually, you know, often we see like these concept cars with the seats turned around like that, and the interiors that look like totally space age. But actually, I can see those look like production seats. They said that we're cl that this is not a concept, a far out kind of design philosophy or, or exercise. That this was relatively production ready, and that it was the, the they they talked about the they're moving away from um, blown air heating and right. going to infrared heating under the floors, like the BMW armrest, I think, and other cars do it as well. But um, they talked about a bunch of stuff that is new, but was all production ready, and so. Look, they, these kind of captain seats are not unusual in the backs of luxury vehicles. We see them in the back of some of the Chinese stuff. Uh, the Lee Mega looks like this. Um, the new Volvo EM90 looks like this in the back. So just the, just the front seat swiveling around like a camper van. But uh, that's all very doable if they yeah. want to. Do you have some more pictures there of the inside at all? Yeah, I was just wondering, I, no, I guess they only have like the four-seat four version of this because uh, not a three-row, at least in, in this concept form. But Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's the dash one and stuff, but yeah, I mean they, they said that this is this is kind of it's it's ready to roll and it's their version of the EV9. So, I mean, okay, right. it's that's an, looks, it looks concepty to me, but that. yeah, I don't know about that front front view there. That screen's popped perched up on the on the dash. <laughs> I'm not sure that works in production, but I guess we'll see. Uh, we can move on though. I guess uh, it's yeah. Let's just wrap this up and talk really quickly. Uh, so if it's been a good news, this good news week this week, if you're looking for an inexpensive electric SUV, the Fisker ocean in sport trim has had its price tag slashed to 24,999. The bad news is aside from the company seemingly days away from complete collapse is that uh, there aren't any actually in the country. So Fisker had this terrible week last week. And this week, it jumped out of that frying pan and into the fire. Uh, Monday, it announced that a deal with a legacy automaker, widely thought to be Nissan, has ended. Uh, then it was delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Then a report came out saying it had lost track of millions of dollars in customer deposits and was generally a disorganized mess. 
Uh, and then it slashed its prices, which basically kills the resale value of its vehicles already in the hands of owners. So its share price has also continued to collapse this week. And the, the company now has a market cap of $11.35 million at yesterday's close. So basically, I think between the four, five of us here, we could probably scrape up enough money to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kyle, this seems like a, a pretty much a cooked goose. Uh, is there a price low enough that would encourage you to buy a Fisker Ocean? And yeah, I only, I only ask you because you're the proud owner of a, of a Coda or maybe two. Yeah, well, I actually like the way this looks. Okay. I've driven the Fisker Ocean. I didn't love the way it drove, but and I certainly did not like the software, but I drove an early pre-production one. And it was always a sign that the Fisker PR team was like, oh, we'll get you a car. We'll get one. But we just are waiting for this one thing. Ah, oh, you know. And so I've had the opportunity. A lot of our viewers own Fisker Oceans. I've had the opportunity to swap cars with them, borrow theirs for some time. And maybe now is a good time to do it while they're in the news and hot. And it could be interesting to see what this car actually is, because I think we're probably getting you know, owners saying this car is amazing. I can't believe it's failing. And then maybe investors or the general public saying, ah, this car is a piece of crap. I'm mm -hmm. sure the answer lies somewhere in the middle. I don't have that much personal experience with it. What I will say is when, and if the company fails, which I'm not a company analyst, but if that were to happen, I really hope there's a third party, some enthusiast group that has access to keep these things running and on the roads because a lot of people paid a lot of money for these and they have a big battery with big range. Right. They're not all terrible. Um, yeah. it's got, it looks great. It's got cool California mode. Like I'm not against the car. It's pretty also, quick too. Yeah, but it's very front wheel drivey and like, not yeah, really true. Too well. And, you know, we know all the guys at Magna that worked on this car and I just give them so much crap for that front wheel driveness on here. I'm like, how could you let that yeah. happen to a performance SUV? And they're like, yeah, but design targets and costs and all these things. And I'm like, but this is stupid. So anyway, they have apparently had a software update to make it very much rear biased and some other things. Ultimately, I think, yeah, if they get cheap enough, we'll have to buy one as long as it makes, you know, as long as people are interested in watching and learning about it, what is right. Fisker ownership like after company failure, if that is to happen, I think would make a cool, you know, six month story, one year story or more, something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we own the VinFast VF8. This is the clear competitor. So it'd be cool to <laughs> pitch them against each other. Oh no. Yeah. I, see well, I know, I know there's not a lot in the country, but there are two in New York City, uh, which I saw yesterday, right there's a Fisker showroom right around the block from Rivian's uh, place, and the whole place seemed cleaned out, like there wasn't no brochures or anything. No one was in there, but there was two vehicles sitting in there. So that there's 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 at least two here if you want to buy one, Kyle. I think the uh, the, the human side of it uh, was driven home to me this week because there's no doubt Fisker's you know on it on its way and selling the cars at a twenty four thousand dollar discount is not not a good sign. No. Um, but as I mentioned at the start, so I've put my podcast, which has been going on for five years, back on YouTube, um, and uh, for various reasons, and of course that allows comments. As everyone knows, the YouTube comments are a fun place to be. And so yesterday's show that I did. Because not with, with with audio podcast, it's quite difficult to get feedback. People email me, they find me on social media. But if I choose not to open the app that day, that's fine, and I can avoid that. Whereas I do want to check the comments, and 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 a couple of people were very very defensive of Fisker. You know, the company is going to pull through, and they've got this amazing. And it was, it was you know like Henrik had written, it was a sales pitch, and it reminded me these people have probably got their own money tied up in it. They probably bought the vehicle. They might have invested in the stock, which is worthless. And this is. And, and I and I sort of sat there last night thinking, yeah, I've done this podcast saying, well, they, you know, they're going bust and you can get a discount and all that kind of stuff. And I thought there's very real humans at the end of this paying their True. bills who are going to be left with a vehicle. And some in my comments, they were saying, yeah, but it's Magna technology. Magna will support it. They've got no obligation. Right. Magna have no obligation. There's to no fiscal. way Magna will support it. That's not no. their job. Their job is no. to produce components for no. automakers and they're fulfilling their contractual agreements with them. It's up to the automakers to support the cars is my understanding. Is how right. Absolutely. Oh, and, yeah, then, and then in the evening I saw, uh, I think, is it Sean at Fiscarati? Um, and that website, which exists as obviously a, a an enthusiast, uh, he closed it down last night with a heavy heart. We're shutting really? down like really, yeah. really? and your body's closed wow. and you're and you're like if that is that was the 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 top tier enthusiast community and he put a, a blog out last night to say that's it we you know that we're done isn't but... this the time to cover fisker closer than ever 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for those guys, for the owners, yeah, they thought, need all is, that support. This is you heartbreaking know? for the, the individuals, the humans involved that have invested years of anticipation into this. And there'll be a blame game down the road of was it mismanaged and where did... And also this story this week, as Dom, as Tom, uh, Dom mentioned a moment ago, of people got cars and never paid for them. Like oh, they yeah, lost, right, right. They lost the checks. Like, I couldn't... It, and, and I thought, this can't be real. And people uh, got the car delivered and wrote the check and then three i think even the car that edmunds bought or maybe it's consumer reports they never cashed the check <laughs> it's like how has this there'll be a blame game down the road for right. now it's a human well, story as kyle says in six months time can you own an ev when the company that built it is bust and that's that's really interesting so I, I see this as like an opportunity to like Magna has no under no obligation to fix or do anything for, for these customers. But I, I see there's an opportunity there for maybe Magna to spin off a new company. I wouldn't grab get involved. It up. No, I wouldn't get involved. I don't think they have any. It's such a you know, Magna is a huge company dealing with a right. you know, million billion dollar deal. I don't even know. But right. this is like such a blip. I'm sure I can. I haven't talked to the Magna folk. I should probably ask them what the heck is going on yeah, over there. Just, I'm sure it's hectic. I'm sure Magna is having a rough go at it because right. they put so much into this Fisker deal. They right. gave them factory space, engineering time, all of these things. And I'm not sure if that was all paid up front by Fisker or if that's paid by per car that they make. I don't know what the deal is. But all I know is that Magna, I think, overextended on the Fisker deal and really screwed themselves on this one. Right. I would be surprised if Magna didn't take it on the chin also, Kyle. I bet all everybody that worked with the company, every they they, they have, you know, debts probably from from all ends. So, yeah, you know, you make a long term play, you know, with when you're paired with a company like that and, and Magna was banking on really making money in the long run with Fisker, not up front like this. I'm I would be shocked to find out that Magna also didn't take a huge hit from this. But yeah, well, at least a, they will. I mean, if they stop production, if they go out of business, that is, you know, 10 plus years of a relationship with an automaker that is just up oh, done. Yeah. After making how many cars? Right. No, basically nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, but can't. the bank that still does have the IP for this, they, they developed this platform, right? So they, they have this platform they could sell to. But they have a bunch of platforms. They got 30 different platforms they could sell. To EV people. platforms? Oh, yeah. They got a bunch of them. Yeah. Okay. A bunch, I mean, tech, I mean, a bunch of different things. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, cause I, uh, I'm not sure this is the platform I would recommend anyone to build their car no. on anyway. It's very similar to, I drove the arc Fox. It's an arc Fox chassis underneath. Okay. And so that's like a Chinese kind of mid tier luxury sedan. And right. then it was tried to be shaped into an electric SUV. Right. That was supposed to be sporty, which are very different design targets. <laughs> yeah. But it's called arc Fox. So, it's marketing. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I, but I do feel bad for, we had a, a, a viewer earlier in the comments that mentioned his sister is now the proud you know, owner of, a, of an orphaned $50,000 car. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a hit basically, you know, because the resale value is probably not going to be great at all. And if anything happens to it, service is a, a challenge, but uh, yeah, I, but I, we should probably leave it at that today. And let y'all get going with your on your with your days uh so if you have any questions or comments please leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice don't forget if you like the show please give us a thumbs up that helps us out a lot and click subscribe tap that bell icon for notifications for you to catch all these midweek interviews we've been doing this week or and hopefully next week uh so yeah thank you all very much for joining us again and we'll see you again very soon